hard. Last week, I am struggling with a sin in my life, and I just really, I really wonder if God loves me. And then I talked to someone on the phone this week, and through their tears, they said, I am struggling in my life, and I, God seems so distant. I don't know if he's hearing my prayers. I really don't know, Pastor Carl, does God love me? And I think we all kind of have this knowledge, yes, God loves us, but does he? I mean, knowing myself like I know myself, knowing my own failures, does God really love me or does he just sort of put up with me? Well, I want to tell you that there is no greater demonstration of love than Easter. And God loves you more than Pastor Carl could ever describe to you. He is crazy about you. He loves you so much that he has made it possible for you to be in a relationship with him. And not just for this time, but for all of eternity. He wants you to be a part of his forever family. Yes, he is a God of justice. And sin must be paid for. The wages, the payment... On sin is death, but God paid it for us. And if you will receive that payment, you can be a part of God's forever family. There is no greater demonstration of love than Easter. In fact, Jesus said, Greater love has no man than to lay down his life for his friend. And of course, you know that verse you learned when you were a child. John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave. He gave his son. No greater demonstration of love than Easter. You see, Easter is all about a relationship. And today we begin a series on relationships. And the Bible has so much to say about relationships from marriage to family to friendships to co-workers to all kinds of relationships. The Bible has much to say about that. Why? Because so much of our happiness in life comes from relationships. And on the flip side, sometimes a lot of pain in our lives comes from relationships. And so we begin a series today on relationships. And we will be looking through April and May, Sunday by Sunday, on what makes great relationships. But the foundation of it all is right here. It is love. And God wants a love relationship with you. God wants a love relationship with you. That's what he wants. He loves you more than Pastor Carl could tell you. God wants a love relationship with you. And that's the basis. That's the beginning for all of our relationships. It is first a vertical relationship with God and a basis for all of our relationships. The outline is in the bulletin, and so you can pull it out and follow along if you'd like. If you didn't get one, the ushers will hand you one if you hold your hand up. Also, as Brother Jeff said, we have a gift for all of our guests today. We're so excited that you're visiting with us, being our guest today. We have a we have a gift for you. It's called The Case for Easter, a little booklet, a little book. And you can get it right out here on my right, out these doors, out the main entrance, just to the right of it by the fireplace there. If you'll just stop out there, they'd be happy to give you uh, one of these books. It is The Case for Easter. It's by a guy named Lee Strobel. I read the the book. It is very simple. It's just 90 pages. I mean, you can read it in one setting. Very simple book, very easy to read, uh, but very good. I mean, it is, this book is good. Lee Strobel was a uh, journalist, uh, reporter for the Chicago Tribune, and an atheist. And listen to what he said. Certainly Christ was only a legend or a mere mortal at best. In their wide-eyed gullibility, Christians sincerely believed he rose from the dead. 
and thus proved that he was the Son of God. But there was no doubt in my mind they were sincerely wrong. Then the unthinkable happened. My wife became a Christian, and I anticipated the worst. Yet, in the ensuing months, I began to see winsome changes in her character and values. When she attributed this transformation to God, I knew it was time to use my journalism and legal training to thoroughly investigate Christianity. Maybe I could liberate her from this cult. The starting point seemed obvious to me clearly. The resurrection was the linchpin of the Christian faith. And so we set forth to disprove and... Uh, the resurrection, and, and really the book is divided into three, three uh, issues, three parts. Did Jesus really die first? And then secondly, was the tomb really empty? Or did the disciples just pull a fast one on people? And, and then did credible people really see him and encounter him in his resurrected body? Well... The first part really gripped my heart because I knew I wanted to talk to you about love today. Did Jesus really die? A lot of people do not think he did. There are some people who think that Jesus just faked it. He just fainted on the cross. They call it the swoon theory. (laughs) That he just fainted on the cross and then when they put him in the cool, damp air of the tomb, he revived got up in the tomb and pushed the stone away and came forth. But when you really know Romans and their execution, their method of execution, and what they did, you realize, wow, that could not be. For the Romans, when they crucified a man, they they started with, beating him within an inch of his life. We call it scourging. The Roman soldier would take a, a stick about 18 inches long that had nine leather straps in it. And at the end of each leather strap was a pellet. And he would sink that into the victim's back and then rip it down his back. Again and again. Josephus tells us that many men did not survive scourging. Many men died just under that beating because when they were done, not only did he have a pool of blood between his feet, but oftentimes his innards were there between his feet and his back was ripped open and you could see his ribs. And they call it a hypovolemic shock. It means a person is suffering from the effects of losing large amounts of blood. His heart races, his blood pressure stops, becomes very thirsty. This is where Jesus was. He was absolutely in a critical condition, almost like a state of shock. As they put that cross on his back after beating him like that and then leading him up and down the streets of Jerusalem out to Golgotha. There they drove the spikes through his hands. Now the Jews, they use the word hand a little more inclusively than we would. We we call this the wrist and this the hand. But their term hand included the wrist. They didn't differentiate, differentiate like we are. And there's a good possibility the spike was driven through the wrist. And the median nerve is there, and the spike would go right through that nerve. You ever hit your crazy bone and a pain shoots up your arm, you know, and you just say, oh, you know. Well, Uh, that's kind of what, I mean, an unbearable pain shooting through the, through the uh, arm. Pain was so unbearable that they had literally had to create a new word. Their language was just didn't describe the intense pain of the cross. The new word that they created was excruciating. That word literally means out of the cross. And then as he hung on the cross, both shoulders would dislocate. Psalm 22 said, my bones are out of joint, and that was fulfilled as a prophecy. And then crucifixion was an agonizingly slow death by asphyxiation. I can hardly say it. Couldn't breathe. 
and uh, had to push up on the spikes. Can you imagine the pain? And uh, trying to breathe. Jesus was on the cross from 9 in the morning till 3 in the afternoon. Suffering. And then the Jewish Sabbath would begin at 6 p.m., 6 in the afternoon. It was Friday, and then the next day begins at 6 p.m. Our day begins at midnight. Theirs began at 6 p.m. and ran till 6 p.m. So tonight at 6 would be Monday. you know. And so they were just hours away from their Sabbath. And so they did not want these men on the crosses during the Sabbath. And so they made that known to the Romans. The Romans took a club like a bat and broke the legs of the two thieves so they couldn't push up and breathe anymore, and they died. They came to Jesus, and they saw that he had already died. But to make sure, a Roman soldier stuck a sword in his side, through his lungs, into his heart. His legs were not broken, because Psalm 34 says that his bones would remain unbroken. Not a bone was broken, as the prophecy said. Did he really die? Well, I'll grant you that these soldiers, they may not have been medical experts, but they were killers. They were executioners. They, they, it was their job. They knew what they were doing. They were experts in killing. And they knew the Roman law that if a, if a prisoner of, of theirs escaped, that they would pay for it with their life. There was no way they were going to risk their own lives. They made sure that he was dead. And no one could fake the inability to breathe for that long. And he was put into the tomb. Let me just read you a paragraph. A person in that kind of pathetic condition could never have inspired his disciples to go out and proclaim that he is the Lord of life who had triumphed over the grave. After suffering that horrible abuse with all the catastrophic blood loss and trauma, he would have looked so pitiful that the disciples would have never hailed him as a victorious conqueror of death. They would have felt sorry for him and tried to nurse him back to health. So it's preposterous to think that if he had appeared to them in that awful state, his followers would have been prompted to start a worldwide movement based on the hope that someday they too would have a resurrected body like his. No, men don't die for a lie. They knew that he died. When I reviewed that, I, the question came to my mind, why? Why would Jesus Christ voluntarily suffer like that? There is only one answer. And that answer is, love. Wow. Did he love me that much? A sinner? Would he love you that much? A sinner? To suffer like that? Wow. That's the foundation for relationships. If you and I are going to build great relationships with other people, we need first to have a relationship with the one who paid such a debt for us. A great vertical relationship. Well, what is love? Well, let's just look at it very quickly. Let me tell you what love is not. Love is not a feeling. Now, sometimes feelings are a part of it, but love is not just a feeling. It is not a quiver in your liver not an ocean of emotion. No, no. It is more, way more, way more than a feeling. Love is not uncontrollable. I know sometimes we say, well, you know, I fell in love. Sort of like I tripped over something and it just happened to me. Uh, and I know what we mean when we say we fell in love, but it's really not uncontrollable. That brings me to the third thing. Love is a choice. Love is something we can choose. In fact, in Colossians chapter 3, it says, it says, 
put on love. Just like you stood in front of your closet this morning and said, what am I going to put on? You know, And put on love. It is something we choose. To me, that's very exciting. Because 45 years ago, I didn't walk up to Gail on campus and say, you've been out with other guys? It's time you went out with me. I'll be by and pick you up tonight at 7.30. Be ready. Nope. She's not a robot. It didn't work that way. It wouldn't have worked that way. <laughs> For sure. And uh, love is a choice. It must be one. That makes it exciting, though, doesn't it? No, and God made us all free will agents. We can choose to love. Here's another thing. Love is, not a, love is a conduct. It is not just words. In 1 John, he says, let us, wor- let us love not just in our words, but in our deeds and what we do. Love is a lifestyle. There is a whole chapter in the Bible about love. Just like there's a resurrection chapter in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. Let me just lift a line out. Just one line. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not seek its own. Well, let's write these down. First of all, love is patient. Love is patient. With all humility, gentleness, and patience, showing tolerance and love one for another. Aren't you glad God is patient with you? The very fact that you and I are able to come here this morning, gather around his book and worship him, is another indication of his great patience. His, we call it grace. Patient. Love is patient with the faults of others, the shortcomings of others. Love is kind. Love is kind, the Bible says. We see this in Ephesians 4. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God and Christ has forgiven you. Tender-hearted. It's so easy to become hard-hearted in a relationship. We don't get what we want. We get offended. We get hurt. We pull back in our shell, and we begin to not be tender-hearted, but hard-hearted. God says, be kind, tender-hearted. Giving. And then, thirdly, I want you to see this. Love is giving. It does not seek its own. It is giving. Somebody said that marriage is give and take. Well, no, marriage is give and give. Wow, that... If I live that way, that, that, that sounds dangerous to me. Somebody might take advantage of me. C.S. Lewis said, love is vulnerable. It is a risk. Love is giving. For God so loved the world, he what? He gave. He gave. You see, everybody's waiting for somebody else to give. God didn't wait. He still gave his son. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. What love. What amazing love. Love is the foundation for our relationships. It is the beginning as we look Sunday after Sunday at these important things that make for great relationships. This is the foundation. Well, how do I keep love alive? Let me just say this to you. Our biggest problem is we take it for granted. We take it for granted. Do you remember when you were trying to win that love? What you went through? And I remember I was uh, I was just in, in graduate school. I had spent several years without any wheels, without a car in college. And I had saved up, and and I bought a 67 Mustang. And, oh, it was a beauty. Why did I not keep that car? Uh, But I bought a beautiful 67 Mustang. I paid $1,750 for it. I still remember. 
It was almost new. And I was so proud of that car. And before I would go to pick up Gail, I would go and wash it. And it was spotless. And I had, I had white floor mats with a Mustang on them. And I would, uh, one of these wooden handle brushes and some babo, I would get down and scrub those floor mats. And then you hang them up, let them dry, put them in the trunk. And <clears throat> before I went to pick her up at the, at the dorm where she lived, I would, they would be in the trunk. And then I would get out, put them in the car. It was spotless. I mean, you could eat off of them. It was spotless. The car was immaculate. Because everything had to be right. I still remember one time I was standing before my closet, just about to go on a date with Gail, and I said, Oh, man, I, I really don't have, a, I don't have a good laundry shirt to wear. And my roommate, Howard, he said, No problem. And he brought me a shirt. Loaned me one of his shirts. And and I was teasing him and giving him a hard time about, you know, and it's the man that makes the clothes and all this, and, and you know, trying to, and, and uh, probably wasn't very grateful. And so I drive over and pick her up. We walk out of the dorm to walk out to the car, and I'm expecting her to say again about, wow, the car looks beautiful. Instead, she said, did you get a new shirt? Oh, uh, no, no, I didn't. No, it's just, you know, one of the shirts. And didn't want to tell her it was Howard's, you know. And got in the car, and again, she said, the shirt is so soft, it's so nice. And I said, whoa, this is nice. And uh, we were going to a football game that night. I remember we just pulled out, and I noticed a little mist on the windshield. And I said, oh, I should, I should have brought an umbrella. Let me swing by. And so I swung by our place to get the umbrella, and I I said, I'll be right back. And I ran in to get the umbrella, and I said, Howard, Howard, how much you want for the shirt? She likes the shirt. I'll make payments, whatever price. She likes the shirt. And Howard's just grinning at me like the cat that got the mouse. Later, I found out that on my way over to pick her up, he called and said, tell him you like his shirt. It's mine. (laughs) I could have killed him. I hold it against him to this day. He was best man in our wedding. But remember what you used to do to impress them? To win their love? How easy it is to take it for granted. The way you became successful is the way you stay successful. Our relationships go south because so many times we don't do what we used to do. How do we keep love alive? Don't take it for granted. How do I handle, Pastor Carl, a love that really has gone south? It's basically died. There's a whole another room here that we could move into, but we don't. Let me just say this. God specializes in resurrections. Yes, he does. Our God defeated sin and the grave and death and brought Jesus back And if he can do that, he can resurrect relationships, change lives. This was the message of the New Testament church. In Acts chapter 2, Peter said this, This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. And then, then again, in the next chapter, The one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. We are witnesses. 
And as the women came to the tomb, the angel said, He has risen from the dead. My friend, he is not in the grave. He has risen from the dead. And on this Easter morning, we rejoice because we serve a living Savior. He is alive today. God specializes in resurrections. And you can know this living Lord. You can have a relationship, a love relationship with Him that can change all other relationships. In fact, the the third section of this book is about the fact that He is alive. I read you the, the tough part about His death. But I just want to turn to page 89 out of 90. Listen to this. Here's what Lee Strobel said. Because of the evidence, I now believe Jesus to be the Son of God. But to become his child, it was necessary for me to receive the free gift of forgiveness that he purchased with his life on the cross. So on November 8, 1981, I talked with God in a heartfelt and unedited prayer, admitting and turning from all my wrongdoing and receiving the free gift of forgiveness and eternal life through Jesus. I told him that with his help, I wanted to follow him in his ways as best I could from that moment forward. Looking back, I can see that this was nothing less than the pivotal event of my life. Now listen to this sentence. This is what I want you to really get. Over time, my character, values, attitude, priorities, worldview, philosophy, and relationships began to change for the good. This is what we're talking about, our relationships. He said, my relationships began to change for the good. So much so that a few months after I became a follower of Jesus, that our five-year-old daughter, Allison, who had previously only known a father who had been profane, angry, verbally harsh, drunken, and all too often absent, walked up to my wife and said, Mommy, I want God to do for me what he has done for Daddy. Wow. It begins with that love relationship with God. He's not in the tomb and you can know him. Lee Strobel called it the pivotal event of his life. This is the greatest thing that can ever happen in your life. The message of Easter is that God loves you more than Pastor Carl could ever, ever describe to you. And he wants a love relationship with you. And it will begin in this life and it will carry right on into eternity. For Jesus said, I have gone to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. He wants that relationship with you for all of eternity. Wow. Maybe you're searching. I hope that you will pursue the truth about Jesus Christ. There is a lot riding on your verdict. Your eternity hinges on your response. In fact, Jesus in John 8 put it this way, for unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Yes, God is a God of justice and sin will be paid for. Either you will pay for your sins or you will receive the payment that was made for Jesus taking your hell on the cross. For he suffered not only physically, like I described a while ago, but he also suffered spiritually when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was separated from the Father, taking my hell on the cross. Wow. Amazing. You see, Easter is the message that God wants a love relationship with you. And it is the beginning of a new relationship that is life-changing. 
end can change all horizontal relationships in your life. God wants a love relationship with you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, so much that you love us. Dear God, we realize that Easter is the greatest demonstration of love that there is. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this great, great demonstration of your love. How I pray that we would respond to that and truly love you. Thank you so much for loving us and for conquering sin and the grave and death and giving to us the gift of eternal life. How I pray that each one here would know Jesus. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I'm pausing in my prayer now to ask you where you sit. To just join me in this prayer. I want you to From your heart, where you sit, talk to God. If you've already received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can thank Him today for His amazing love, His amazing grace. If you've yet to do so, you can do like Lee Strobel, and you can just receive the gift. You can say, Yes, Lord. I do need your forgiveness. I need a Savior, for I have sinned. I need Jesus Christ who died on the cross for me. You can invite him to be your Savior. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for Jesus, our Savior. How I pray that everyone here would know him, would have a wonderful Easter today, because they are in a love relationship with you. In his name we pray, amen.